In this presentation, we are going to take a look at the book of Ezekiel, specifically chapters 1 through 3, then chapters 33 through 34, 36 to 37, and then chapter 47. As always, I would read the chapters before watching so you're familiar with the details and the storyline. I think you'll get more out of it. By way of introduction, through Ezekiel, the Lord gave wayward and backsliding Israel a message of warning and reproof of justice and judgment, of mercy and love that left no doubt of his indignation of their unrighteousness nor of his desire for their repentance. Ezekiel taught out all are responsible for their own actions and will be rewarded or punished according to the way they use the agency given them. He taught that no one can reject the Lord's counsel and escape the judgments that invariably follow justice and that are intended to purge the soul of iniquity. He taught also that no one who re repents and turns from his iniquities will lose the blessings of God's mercy, love, and forgiveness. These principles apply to individuals and to nations. They apply to the individual Israelites and the whole nation of Judah, Israel, to whom Ezekiel prophesied. God will not justify the sinner, nor forsake those with whom he has made covenants, if they will but fulfill their part of the agreement. In Ezekiel's time, the Lord's covenant people had rejected him and needed to be refined in the fires of tribulation and sorrow in order to be turned from their iniquitous ways of life. Although because of his justice, God allowed those tribulations, because of his infinite love and mercy, he continued to extend the promise of forgiveness and life to the repentant soul and of the restoration of all the former blessings that is to Israel if they would return to him. The Lord had one great prophet, Jeremiah, in the court at Jerusalem, another Daniel in the court at Babylon, and a third Ezekiel among the exiles in Babylonia. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were of priestly lineage. Daniel may have been of royal lineage. Jeremiah served the Lord by delivering his warnings and instructions to the kings and leaders of the soon-to-be-conquered, Daniel to the conquerors, and Ezekiel to the exiles. Ezekiel, whose name means God is strong or God will strengthen, was the son of Buzi and a priest of the family of Zadok. He was carried captive to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar in the captivity of Jehoiakim. So a little background upon him. Just going back a little bit where it said that one of the reasons Ezekiel's message was to teach that because God's covenant people had rejected him, they needed to be refined by tribulation. Well, that should be a message for us today in the church, that if we reject him, and I'm talking about individually, but as collective, as, as, as a group, if we're not keeping the covenant of Latter-day Israel, then we will need to be refined by tribulation. So, so do you see why President Nelson will prophesy and say that, look, in the future, the church is going to get persecuted more? Yeah, because we're not refined yet. We still have those among us who profess to believe who are not. Just look at the nonsense political thing that's going on to Mike Lee and McMuffin, or whatever his name is. And both members of the church and McMuffin just outright lies. And he professes to be of the covenant. And this is how he treats a fellow priesthood holder? Just for political power? And you don't think we as a people will have judgments come upon us? Boy. These, these prophets are important to us because Latter-day Israel has its own problems. And it needs to be refined and we need to weed out, it needs to weed out, or the Savior Jehovah Christ needs to weed out those among us in Israel today that profess to be righteous but are not. Well, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1 
and 4 through 28, Ezekiel's record of his vision. He has a vision here. And so let's just take a look at some of the elements and the symbolism and what it means. It is very difficult, if not impossible, for a mortal to convey in writing the message and spirit of a vision or other revelation from God so that the reader will have a complete understanding of what took place and what was communicated. Such was the challenge of Ezekiel in describing his transcendent vision of heaven. Others, too, have faced the similar challenge. Joseph Smith said that could you gaze into heaven five minutes, you would know more than you would, than you would by reading all that was ever written upon the subject. One must experience revelation to, fully, to understand it fully. Those, including Ezekiel, who have had visions, visitations or visions from the eternal world, have often used symbolism, metaphor, simile, comparisons, <coughs> excuse me, and other kinds of figurative languages, language to try to convey the experience they had and the message they received. Therefore, everything Ezekiel said need not be taken literally, for he had used many figurative expressions to try to tell what, which was far beyond mortal experience. Many times, for example, he used words like as, likeness, and appearance. So one of the challenges for any prophet, any dispensation that has a vision of heaven, is to now try to describe it in mortal terms. And that's what Ezekiel is going to try to do here. First, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4, whirlwind. The words wind, tempest, or storm could better fit the meaning instead of Ezekiel 1, 4. In Ezekiel 1, 4. A wind that revolves on its own axis with great rapidity is not what is meant by the Hebrew word translated whirlwind. Rather, the idea of a furious or powerful wind is what was intended. The metaphor signifies the power of God. For instance, the power of God's presence was indicated to Job through allusion to a whirlwind. See Job 38.1. When the Lord poured out his spirit with great power at the dedication of the Kirpin Temple in this dispensation, it was described as a noise was heard like the sound of a rushing, mighty wind which filled the temple. And so that's what he means by when he's heard or sees a whirlwind. In Ezekiel 1, 4.13, he discusses clouds, fire, brightness, the color of amber, lamps, and lightning. These figures are used throughout the scriptures in association with the power, glory, power, and majesty of God's presence or that of his messengers. And I have all these references on here. I'm not going to read them. Of those who see this on YouTube, if you want to look those up, look those up. But clouds, fire, amber, lightning, it's all symbolic of God's glory, his power. So when he says, I saw this as this, as brightness, as lightning, so I'm seeing, in other words, he said, I'm seeing God's glory, his majesty. Ezekiel 1, 5 through 6, 10, he saw four creatures with four faces. In his vision, Ezekiel saw four creatures, each of which had four faces. The four had the face of a man, a lion, an ox, and the face of an eagle. The Apostle John had a similar vision. In his vision, the creatures were described as being like a lion, like a calf, having a face of as a man, and like a flying eagle. Revelation 4.7 The prophet Joseph explained that the four beasts in John's vision were representative of class of beings. The faces of the creatures in Ezekiel's vision seem to represent the same thing. The following interpretations from an ancient Jewish summary is in harmony with that view. Quoting, man is exalted among creatures, the eagle is exalted among birds, the ox is exalted among domestic animals, the lion is exalted among wild beasts, and all of them have received dominion and, his, and greatness has been given them, yet they are stationed below the chariot of the Holy One. And so they're representative of all God's creatures. These four different classes represent four different categories. 
Ezekiel saw that the throne of God was above the creatures. That placement represents his having dominion over all living things, though he provides the means for all his creations, both human and animal, to enter into eternal glory, each in their appropriate order. Ezekiel 1.6 was represented by the wings the creature had. The Lord taught Joseph Smith that the wings of the beast John saw in his revelation, John, Revelation 4.8, are a representation of power to move and to act, Doctrine and Covenants 77.4. That interpretation also seems to apply to the creatures in Ezekiel's vision. So the creatures that he sees, they have power to move and to act, represented and symbolic by the wings they had. Ezekiel 1, 9 and 11, their wings were joined together. What was that representing? The creatures of Ezekiel's vision were in complete harmony and unity. They moved as one, symbolizing the total unity that exists among all living things who submit to God's will. When we completely submit to God's will and live with him, we will be in complete unity with him. That's why I have to demonstrate that down here before I can be there. That's why Joseph Smith can say in the lectures on faith, a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things, which just is another way of saying, a religion that does not require the submission of one's will to the will of God in all things does not have the power to save them. Ezekiel 1, 7, feet like burning brass. The word straight in Ezekiel 1, 7 means standing upright, not bent as when sitting or kneeling. That is, the creatures did not travel as a person travels when walking. <clears throat> Sounds like that their mode of transportation was above what mortals could do. The comparison of the sole of their feet to that of of a calf seems to refer to the smoothness of a cow's hoof to indicate the shininess of the feet of the beast. There is scarcely anything that gives a higher luster than highly polished or burnished, bar, mm, burnished brass. Polished brass is translated amber. It signifies beauty and glory. Ezekiel 1, 15 through 21, what is represented by the wills that Ezekiel describes. So we get this whole thing about will inside of wills and what is going on. Because Joseph Smith received from the Lord some keys for interpreting the meaning of the beast in John's vision, and that can be found in Dr. Covenant 77, 2 through 4, the parallels between John's vision and Ezekiel's give some clues to the meaning of the beast Ezekiel saw. There is, however, no parallel in John's vision to the wills seen by Ezekiel. The prophet Joseph Smith said, I make this broad declaration, that whenever God gives a vision of an image or beast or figure of any kind, he always holds himself responsible to give a revelation or interpretation of the meaning thereof. Otherwise, we are not responsible or accountable for our belief in it. Don't be afraid of not of don't be afraid of being damned for not knowing the meaning of a vision or a figure if God has not given a revelation or interpretation of the subject. Now that's pretty darn clear. Thus applying to Ezekiel now in this vision of what the wills are, God's never given us what that means. So, at present, the interpretation of Ezekiel's vision has not been given to the church. So the Lord does not hold his saints accountable for understanding what it represents by the wills. And anyone who can tell you what they exactly mean, do not know. Ezekiel 1, 26-28, Ezekiel saw God upon his throne. Ezekiel saw a firmament or expanse above or over the creatures. Above the firmament, Ezekiel saw God sitting on his throne in his glory. 
Ezekiel used several items to describe the brilliance, beauty, and glory of God. Then, as a humble witness to such be glory, beauty, and majesty, he fell upon his face in awe and reverent submission. Gospel principle concerning this chapter. In the eternal realms where God is above all, all of God's creatures will be saved with power to move and act beyond mortal ability are in, and are in complete unity. I, and I probably should add, with him. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, 9 through 10 and chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. What is meant by the role of a book the Lord caused Ezekiel to eat? In a similar experience, the Apostle John, too, was commanded to eat a book. The Lord, through the prophet Joseph Smith, explained that this action represented a mission given to John among the tribes of Israel. That's Doctrine and Covenants 77, 14. So when John, in the book of Revelation, was told to eat a book, we learn from this question and answer period that Joseph has with Christ, that what is, what, was, what is that symbolic? Well, that was symbolic of meaning he had a mission to perform. And one of them was to go among the tribe, the ten tribes of Israel to prepare them. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said the following, John's act of eating a book containing the word of God to him was in keeping with the custom and tradition of ancient Israel. The act signified that he was eating the bread of life, that he was partaking of the wor good word of God, that he was feasting upon the word of God, which was in his mouth sweet as honey. But it made his bit belly bitter. That is, the judgments and plagues promised those to whom the Lord's word was sent caused him to despair and have sorrow of soul. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my feet, mouth. Sorry, Psalms 119, 103. Such is the exulting cry of the psalmist. And conversely, how bitter is the penalty for rebellion and disobedience. Ezekiel had a similar experience. He was commanded to eat a roll, meaning a book, which was in his mouth as, mouth as honey for sweetness. But in the writing itself, there was lamentations, mournings, and woe. So, Ezekiel feasted upon the word of Christ, which is sweet, but also knowing the calamities which had come upon his people in captivity, that was bitter. Gospel principle. For the gospel to have the impact of renewing ourselves through the atonement of Jesus Christ, we must internalize it. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 8, I have made thy face and thy forehead strong. The words of Ezekiel 3 8 are a Hebrew idiom suggesting essentially the English idiom face up to it. The Lord promised Ezekiel power, courage, and firmness since his mission was to a very rebellious and stubborn people. The Lord gives his humble servant sufficient strength to withstand the world's opposition as they seek to do his will. Uh, Ezekiel was going to go to a very hard-hearted people because here they're in captivity because of their sins. So these are not righteous people. Hopefully they're in the process of being humbled, but they're not yet. And the Lord makes Ezekiel equal to the task. And it makes his forehead strong, makes him strong, makes him able to face up to his calling and fulfill his mission. Ezekiel 3, 17 through 21. There can be jeopardy in being a watchman. Chapter 3 talks about the watchman in Israel. Ezekiel's prophecies did not fall on friendly ears. But as a watchman, he had to raise the warning voice. The analogy of the watchman referred to the military watchman who had to stay awake and who faced execution if he failed to warn the city when the enemy approached. Such a watchman was in jeopardy always. The enemy sought to destroy him to keep him from raising the warning, and if he did not raise the warning when it was needed, his life was in jeopardy at the hands of those he was responsible to warn. Likewise, watchmen in the Lord's kingdom have a serious responsibility with far-reaching consequences. Those priesthood leaders and auxiliary, leader, auxiliary leaders who have stewardship over others and to be watchmen 
will be held accountable for how well they fulfill their responsibility, just like the soldier was. Elder President uh, Elder Ezra Taft Benson taught the following. As watchmen on the Tower of Zion, it is our obligation and right as leaders to speak out against current evils. Evils that strike at the very foundation of all we hold dear as the true church of Christ. As one of these watchmen, with a love of humility, I accept humbly this obligation and challenge and gratefully strive to do my duty without fear. In times of serious in times as serious as these, we must not permit fear of criticism to keep us from doing our duty, even at the risk of our counsel being ta tabbed as political as government becomes more and more entwined in our daily lives. In the crisis through which we are now passing, we have been fully warned. This has brought forth some criticism. There are some of us who do not want to hear the message. It embarrasses us. The, thing which, the things which are threatening our lives, our welfare, our freedoms are the very things some of us have been condoning. Many do not want to be disturbed as they continue to enjoy their comfortable complacency. The church is founded on eternal truth. We do not compromise principle. We do not surrender our standards regardless of current trends or pressures. Our allegiance to truth as a church is unwavering. Speaking out against immoral or unjust actions has been the burden of prophets and disciples of God from time immemorial. It was for this very reason that many of them were persecuted. Nevertheless, it was their God-given task as watchmen on the tower to warn the people. That has to be hard for any priesthood leader. As they speak by the Spirit, they will speak things that some will take to be hard. And as Nephi said, only the guilty take the truth to be hard. And so it will condemn their guiltiness. And they will fight out against it and try to put down the watchman. And that's where they have to be vigilant and just stand their ground and teach truth and let the chips fall where they may. I've been in leadership positions where I've had to teach the truth. I've had to tell what Christ has told me to tell. And it was not fun. Some did not like it. Oh, well. Gospel principle, a priesthood calling of leadership bears great responsibility. One that should not be taken lightly by the one called or those called to sustain. Ezekiel 3, 25 through 27, what is meant by Ezekiel, Ezekiel's being bound? Ezekiel was called to prophesy to a very obstinate people. And as Nephi later said, the gilly take the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. Hearing messages of reproof and warning, the unrighteous rose up against Ezekiel. They sought to quiet their, his preaching and hinder his work, either by physically binding and confinement, though there is no scriptural record that, they actually, that this did actually happen, or, which is more likely by rejecting his message, refusing to listen, and seeking to get others to do the same, thus binding Ezekiel's effectiveness. Either way, it was disobedience, and it was open rebellion against God. Right? Whether you do it physically or you do it figuratively, it, it doesn't matter. The consequence is the same. You'll reap the justice of God. Ezekiel 33, 2 through 9. I have set thee a watchman to the house of Israel. So again, now a whole chapter is dedicated to this idea of watchman. Ezekiel 33, 2 through 9 reiterates the teaching also of the watchman found in Ezekiel 3, 17 through 21 that we already talked about. Elder, Elder Spencer W. Kendall explained the need to have a watchman. I am sure that Peter and James and Paul found it unpleasant business to constantly be calling people to repentance and warning them of dangers, but they continued unflinchingly. So we, your leaders, must be everlastingly at it. If young people do not understand, then the fault may be partly ours, but if we make the true way clear to you, then we are blameless. So, I wish today to help define meanings of words and acts for you, young people, to fortify you against error, against pain, and against sorrow. 
and so he gave that down at BYU, that uh, they will have to say some unpleasant things. And as, as long as a priesthood leader, an auxiliary leader does that, then they will not be held accountable for the act, the, regardless of whether the audience listens to what you have to say. If they don't warn the people and the people sin, then the leader is held accountable. So that's why you have to be careful. Ezekiel 33, 11 through 19, repenting of sin. The Savior finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but wants the wicked to turn away from their ways and live in righteousness. That's verse 11. Ezekiel 3, 12 through 19 says that one's righteous deeds will not cancel out one's works of iniquity. If a sinner turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, however, his sins will not be mentioned on his account. So you can't just build up a bunch of good deeds and hope that balances out the sin. No, you have to repent of sin. However, if you sin and repent, then that does wipe out the sin. I remembered them no more. So the, 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 the only way out of the conundrum down here is repentance. Repentance is not to be procrastinated, nor is it to be t- trifled with every day, said Joseph Smith. Daily transgression and daily repentance, meaning incomplete or sincere, is not what is pleasing in the sight of God. But the prophet also said, there is never a time when the spirit is too old to approach God. All are within the reach of pardoning mercy who have not committed the unpardonable sin. So what he is saying, if you're daily having to repent of the exact same sin, the exact same thing, you're not really truly repenting. Because part of repenting is to push the sin aside, not to go back to it, not, not to keep repeating the sin, to cast it away, to change. But he's also saying that, yes, we're human. And as long as I am trying and willing, God will continually work with me. So don't trifle with repentance. Don't just think it's this, oh, I confess the bishop, I'm done, and, and make it this little trifly thing. No, we should be repenting, changing, and putting some things behind us on a regular basis. Elder Spencer W. Kimball further commented on the need to provide restitution for sin, as noted in Ezekiel 35.15. He said, When one is humble in sorrow, has unconditionally abandoned the evil, confessed to those assigned by the Lord, he should next restore, insofar as possible, that which was damaged. If he burglarized, he should return to the rightful owner that which was stolen. Perhaps one reason murder is unforgivable is that having taken a life, the murderer cannot restore it. Restitution in full is not possible. However, the truly penitent soul will usually find things which can be done to restore to some extent. The true spirit of repentance demands this. Ezekiel taught if the wicked restore the pledge, Given, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live and he shall not die. A pleading sinner must also forgive all people of all offenses committed against himself. The Lord is under no obligation to forgive us unless our hearts are fully purged of all hate, bitterness, and accusations against all others. That is something to contemplate, something I'm trying to work on. If I expect the Lord to do that for me, I must do it for my fellow man. Gospel principle, there is no substitute for repentance. Ezekiel 33, 21-33. Ezekiel heard of the destruction of Jerusalem. In Ezekiel 24, 27, it was announced to Ezekiel that the silence which began with his wife's death and the siege of Jerusalem would be ended when fugitives from the captured city should arrive in Babylon. This took place a year and five months, see verse 21, after Jerusalem fell, and Ezekiel began once again more to receive and proclaim messages from God. This passage contains two of these. The first was directed against the wicked survivors who'd remained in the land of Israel and boasted that it would still be theirs, verse 24. 
They were designed to perish and the land would be utterly stored in order that God's wrath against their sin might be shown to the utmost. Verses 25 through 29. The second describes the changed attitude of the exiles towards Ezekiel. They were now interested in his words, discussing them in their gatherings, and listening eagerly to what he had to say, that's verse 30, yet their interest had more of curiosity and like a lovely form of entertainment than of earnestness, it's verses 31 through 32. Not until the final punishment of the wicked survivors took place would they recognize Israel as a prophet indeed, verse 33. Ezekiel 34, the shepherds of Israel. In this chapter, Israel is described as God's flock. Its former king and religious leaders were evil shepherds who sought their own selfish ends and were careless and were careless of what became of the sheep. The flock had become the prey of wild beasts, the heathen nations. God would judge the evil shepherds and deliver the sheep from them. In contrast to the Lord's care of his flock, the shepherds of Israel fed themselves, but not the flock. The neglected shepherds did not strengthen the sick, bind up the broken, bring back again those who were driven away, or seek for the lost sheep, all of which any real shepherd would do for his own sheep. Instead, they ruled the sheep with force and cruelty and let them wander to become a prey to beasts. That's what's talked about in verses 2 through 10. No wonder Jerusalem was captured and Israel was taken captive. This is what their leaders were doing, and then, then it will spread to the people and how they will treat each other. Christ would himself be the shepherd of his people, gathering the scattered and lost, caring for the sick and wounded, feeding the flock in security. That's verses 11 through 16. The flock, too, had been divided against itself. The fat and the strong cattle, the upper classes, had tyrannized over the lean and weak, the common people. God would judge the overbearing cattle also, members of his church, who would not give of their substance to those in need. Perhaps some even saying, This man hath brought upon him has brought upon himself his misery. Therefore I will not share I will therefore I will stay my hand and will not give unto him of my food, nor impart unto him of my substance, that he may not suffer that he may not suffer, for his punishments are just. That's from Mosiah four seventeen. So you can see men in the upper class probably saying, No, I'm not gonna help my fellow man, he deserves what he gets. Instead of keeping the commandment that the people of the church should impart of their substance, everyone according to that which he had. If he had more abundantly, he should impart more abundantly. And of him that had but little, but little should be acquired. And to him that had not should be given. Mosiah 18.27 And so not only were the leaders cruel and bad shepherds, the people looking after one another were bad shepherds because of the example of their leaders. And they... the. The people are now were tyrannizing each other. We see that today, even within the church. He would Christ would unite his flock under the line of David, who is Christ, as their shepherd, who would feed them in a peaceful and fertile land, untroubled by beasts of prey. That's verses 17 through 31. This chapter is the basis of the Lord's parable of the lost sheep. Certainly, Christ, when he comes, he is the lost sheep that that these kings and the people caused. And Christ is now trying to find them. Gospel principle. Not only are priesthood and auxiliary leaders shepherds who will be accountable for their stewardship, but we are all shepherds to each other and will be accountable for how we treat each other. Ezekiel 36, the house of Israel will be gathered to its own lands. The only verses in Ezekiel 36 that do not deal with the last days are those that explain why the Lord scattered Israel. See verses 16 through 22. None of the following 
None of the following events have fully transpired, though today is the day when these prophecies are being fulfilled. 1. Those men who will multiply upon the land are from all the house of Israel, not just the kingdom of Judah. See verse 10. Israel is to walk upon the land which shall no more henceforth bereave them of men. Verse 12 and 13 through 14. Those who return will be gathered from the heathen and from all countries. Verse 24. They are to be cleansed from their filthiness. Verse 25. They are to be converted to the Lord and receive his spirit. Verse 26 through 27. Verses 28 through 38 explain that the recovery of Israel will be quite remarkable and will be done for the Lord's reasons, not because Israel has earned it. Verse 32. We don't earn anything from Christ. Let's get that straight right up front. Everything will be because of the grace of Christ. The Israel of the future must be spiritually worthy and must submit themselves to the Lord's will. So Ezekiel 36, yeah, we're seeing the fulfillments of a lot of this, but it's still a lot of work to be done. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, is Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Bones about the resurrection or about the renewal of the house of Israel. Often prophetic utterances have dual meanings. We saw that with Isaiah a lot. Such is the case for the well-known allegory of the scattered dry bones. The beauty of prophecy is that the Lord can reveal to those who are spiritually alert more than one truth in one prophecy. Sidney B. Sperry wrote the following commentary on the dual nature of this prophecy, quoting, It will be seen from this passage that the doctrine of the resurrection from the dead is invoked to symbolize the restoration of Israel's exiles to their own land. The exiles are represented, so it seems to me, as having lost hope, their bones are dried up, of ever living as a nation. But the Lord shows them that they can be restored through his mighty power, even as the dead bones will be raised in the resurrection. The doctrine of the resurrection of the body is assumed. Some writers contend that the idea of the resurrection was not known among the Hebrews at this early time. But the fact that Ezekiel speaks as he did should seem to me an indication that the doctrine had long been understood in Israel. Any true prophet would understand the doctrine of the resurrection. So Latter-day Saints believe, and Israel had many prophets long before Ezekiel's time. The symbolic meaning of this prophecy as it relates to the gathering of Israel is apparent. The bones represent Israel in its lost and scattered state. The graves indicate where Israel is as well as its condition of spiritual death. The spirit or ruach in Hebrew means that the new spirit of righteousness the people will have when they have been resurrected, that is, restored from their fallen state. The source of this new life will be the Holy Ghost. But Ezekiel's account of the resurrection is literal as well as symbolic of the future gathering of Israel. Elder Bruce R. McConkie testified, There is nothing more real, more literal, more personal than the resurrection, as Ezekiel then beheld in vision. He saw the dead living again, live literally and personally, each one becoming in physical makeup as he had been in mortality. It was with each of them as it would be with their Lord. When he, having come forth from his valley of dry bones, stood in the upper room with his disciples, ate before them, and permitted them to handle his physical body. To his people the Lord's voice came, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. He who shall do all this, as we are now acutely aware, is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the God of Israel. Ezekiel 37, 15-17, what was the meaning anciently of the word sticks? This is a famous scriptures in the church where Ezekiel will take the stick of Judah and the stick of Ephraim, they'll become one in thy hands. Was that just talking about the kingdoms, meaning the people will become one in thy hands? Was it talking about scripture Let's take a look at that. Bible scholars who are not Latter-day Saints have insisted 
that the traditional Christian interpretation of the word stick would be a rod or scepter rather than a record of some kind. They conclude that uniting the two tribes' scepters vividly symbolized the reunification of the divided tribes. See, they, they, they would not see the Book of Mormon and the Bible going hand in hand as a fulfillment of this prophecy at all. No, it's just kings and the tribes coming back together, the two kingdoms reuniting. But as Keith Missouri, professor of ancient scripture at BYU, former professor, pointed out the following. Recent exciting discoveries now confirm the correctness of Joseph Smith's interpretation in a way impossible in 1830. But before discussing these new discoveries, let's take a quick look at some linguistic points. Both stick in the English King James Version and rod in the Greek Septuagint Version are very unusual translations of the word ets, whose basic meaning is wood. The modern nation of Iraq includes almost all of Mesopotamia, the homeland of the ancient kingdom of Assyria and Babylon. In 593 BC, when Ezekiel was called to be a prophet, he was living in exile in Babylonia. As he walked in streets, he would have seen the typical scribe pressing a wedge-shaped stylus into a moist clay tablet to make the complex writings fam familiar to us as cuneiform, meaning wedge-shaped. But, but scholars today know that other kinds of records were being made in Mesopotamia. Papyrus, parchment, and wooden tablets. Though only the clay tablets have survived the millennia, writers refer to other writing materials on their clay tablets. One such writing style was called wood tablets. Modern archaeologists knew that papyrus and parchment were, but what were these wood tablets? How could cuneiform be written on wood? Some years ago, San Nicolo, an archaeologist, remembered that Romans and Greeks both made wood wax tablets for keeping rec record keeping purposes out of boards whose surfaces had been cut below the edge in order to hold a thin coating of wax. Scribes wrote on the wax. The raised edges protected the inscribed surfaces when two tablets were put together. Could the Babylonians have done the same thing? Five years later, a discovery made in the, in the territory that had been ancient Assyria confirmed his theory to the letter. The discovery, directed by archaeologist Max Malwin, was made in a layer of sludge deep in a well in Nimrod, a city known as Kala in the Bible. By the end of the day, workmen had found fragments of two complete sets of tablets, one of ivory and the other of walnut, each composed of 16 boards. All of the surface of the boards were cut down a tenth of an inch, leaving a half-inch wide raised edge all around. The lower surface provided a bed for wax filling, of which some Thin, biscuit-like fragments were found either still adhering to the boards or mixed in the sludge nearby. The covered boards had hinge marks on both sides, making it evident that all 16 in each seat had once been joined together like a Japanese folding screen. The whole work made such an extensive record that Malin would announce his discovery as the oldest known, known example of a book. With these things in mind, we can see how we might translate Ezekiel 35, 15, 17 in this way. These are the words of the Lord to me, man. Take one leaf of a wood tablet and write on it, Judah and his associates of Israel. Then take another leaf and write on it, Joseph, the leaf, wooden tablet, of Ephraim and all the associates of Israel. Now bring the two together to form one tablet. Then they will be a folding tablet in your hand. This translation is faithful to what we know of Ezekiel's language and culture. Isn't it interesting? God's prophets will always be vindicated. Ezekiel 37, 15 through 17 is not talking just about the reunification and probably not even talking about that, but it is talking about the scriptures and the records would become one in my hands. They each would have right records. And in their case, it was on wooden tablets. 
Who'd have thought the prophets are always right? Now Ezekiel 37, 15 is fulfilled. Elder Boyd K. Packer, in discussing the coming forth of the new edition of the LDS Bible that was cross-referenced with Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, shows fulfillment of Ezekiel, that should be 37, verses 15 through 17. Here is the story he tells from General Conference. James Mortimer, long experienced in publishing scriptures, and Dr. Ellis T. Rasmussen, recently Dean of Religious Instruction, this was given in 1982, at Brigham Young University, called at the Cambridge University Press in Cambridge, England. Bibles had been printed at this press, prestigious press, for 293 years before Ebert Grandin opened his print shop in Palmyra. They met with Mr. Roger Coleman, Director of Religious Printing, publishing, to discuss the publication of a most unusual edition of the King James Bible. The printers were quite as skeptical about this proposal as Edward Grandin had been 150 years before. The Cambridge Press had been publishing the King James Bible since the first edition in 1611, but they had never been asked to do anything like this. The text was to remain exactly as it was, no change, not one. But all footnoting, cross-reference, chapter introductions, indexes, and so on were to be replaced. Only the chapter and verse numbering of the 66 books would, retain, would be retained. And that was just the beginning. This edition of the Bible would be cross-referenced with three other books of Scripture. The Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. The printers had barely heard of them. But there was more. A new innovative system of footnoting was to be used. Instead of progressing from A to Z in each chapter, the letters would start over in each verse, for innumerable verses would have many footnotes in them. The technical problems seemed insurmountable. Computers could help, but there was always the human factor. How could you cross-reference the Bible with any other book? The cross-reference to cross-reference it with the three volumes was to require tens of thousands of footnotes. Thereafter, there would be hundreds of thousands of possible combinations of information. It was too big even to think about. The technical challenge alone was staggering to say nothing of maintaining accuracy, harmony, and consistency with the biblical text itself. It could not be done. All of the problems mentioned so far related only to the printing part of the project. The actual compiling and organizing of tens of thousands of footnotes would require many hundreds of workers. This work had already been underway for several years. Without the computer, it would be manifestly impossible. That was also was but a beginning. There would, be a combina uh, there would be a combined concordance and topical guide listing hundreds of subjects, a Bible dictionary, maps, and a new format. New, cha new chapter headings would be written, all in harmony with the sacred message of the Old and the New Testaments. After more than seven years of quiet, intensive work, the Latter-day Saint edition of the King James Bible came off the press. Already work was well underway on the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Over the years, manuscripts had come into our hands, which made possible the correction of printer errors which had crept into earlier editions. Finally, after two more years, the book came off the press, the most accurate we have ever had. The stick or record of Judah, the Old Testament, and the New Testament and the stick or record of Ephraim, the Book of Mormon, which is another testament of Jesus Christ, are now woven together in such a way that as ye pour over one, you are drawn to the other. As you learn from one, you are enlightened by the other. They are indeed one in our hands. Ezekiel's prophecy now stands fulfilled. That is when we got the LDS edition of the Bible with all of the footnotes and cross-references. We lived in a day of fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, 15 through 7. 
Ezekiel's prophecy now stands fulfilled. They are literally one in our hands. As we have cross-referenced both the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, those writings have all become one, and we can study them as one like we've never done before. Rising Generation doesn't know of that story, and we just take for granted that the Bible has always been like this and had all those wonderful footnotes and helps and the concordance in the back and the Bible dictionary and the maps. No, that did not come about until 1982. What a great blessing. Ezekiel 37, 26-28, a Latter-day Temple in Jerusalem. Ezekiel prophesied in 37, 26 through 28 about a holy sanctuary, a temple that would be part of the great reunification of Israel. Soon after his vis this vision, Ezekiel received a detailed vision of what the new temple in Jerusalem would be like. That's in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, the details of the temple. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught the following. Ezekiel predicted the building of a temple in Jerusalem, which would be used for ordinance work after the gathering of Israel from their long dispersion and when they are cleansed from their, their transgressions. That has not happened yet. Let's not get all hyperventilated about the second coming yet. I mean, yeah, we're in the last days, but do you see a temple being used for ordinance work in Jerusalem yet? Waters will issue forth from the temple, Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. The prophet Joseph Smith proclaimed, Judah must return, Jerusalem must be rebuilt, and a temple and water come out from under the temple. See, that's what's described in these verses in Ezekiel 47. Back to the quote. And the waters of the Dead Sea be healed. Have you heard that yet? Have you seen that yet? No, that is still yet to be. It will take some time to rebuild the walls of the city and the temple. And all this must be done before the Son of Man will make his appearance. So there is to be a temple one day where living water will issue forth from underneath it and it will travel down to the Dead Sea and make that a fresh water lake once again and heal it. That will be interesting to see that fulfilled. And that is all before the millennial reign and coming of Jesus Christ and what we call his second coming. The water issuing forth from under the temple and the healing of the Dead Sea may occur when the Lord sets his foot upon the Mount of Olives, causing this mountain to divide into, in two and create a large valley. You can see Zechariah 14.4 and Doctrine and Covenants 133.20-24 concerning that. Maybe that event also has to do with water that will eventually issue forth from under the temple that will heal the Dead Sea. I don't know. It will be interesting to see. Gospel principle. Knowing the signs of the times can help us not be debilitated by fear, uncertainty, and misconception. The second coming is not tomorrow, it's not next week, and it's not even next year. It doesn't mean we don't prepare for it, but I don't have to start hyperventilating, and that can de 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 debilitate me just as much and thinking, oh, it's in the current, oh, my red, it's as, as, as anything else. No, live your life in righteousness and just be prepared for any time. And anyone who tries to give you an exact timeline and has seen and studied all the signs of the times and they show you this timeline and they give you even approximate dates, run, run like the wind away from them. Just know the events. Know that things will happen and watch for them. But live in righteousness for those who are prepared need not fear. Ezekiel 47, 23 through 23, who are these strangers? Undoubtedly, there will be converts who are not part of the blood of Israel, who will receive an inheritance because of their devotion to the gospel. 
they will then be adopted into the house of Israel. These strangers may be some of the Gentile peoples who will accept the gospel in the last days. Gospel principle, whether a literal descendant or adopted into the house of Israel makes no difference in the eternal inheritance a righteous member of the house of Israel will receive. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you gained and liked some things from the book of Ezekiel. Hit the like button if you did, and please subscribe to the channel.